Heavenly Father, we're grateful for uh, the, the guidance you've given us in your word for how we, we know we can help people, we can find the, the help we need from scripture, the confidence that that gives us. Father, we ask now that as we continue to explore the topic of counseling, that you would give us wisdom, help us to understand. In Jesus' name, amen. All righty. So, reviewing what we went over last week, I don't know if there were any questions, comments on, on what we went over before, but we saw how Christians must be marked by love. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, by the love ye have one for another. That's John thirteen thirty five. We also saw how love grows when you gain knowledge and discretion. We saw that it takes time, teaching, and training to develop discretion. And then when we got into who is responsible for counseling, we saw godly men are responsible for shepherding the local church. God calls elders to humbly lead the local church, both publicly and privately. And then every Christian is... Uh, should be equipped and responsible for counseling. Um, I've got is on this slide, but it really, it really is is the the what should be. In Romans fifteen fourteen, it, it says, "I am confident, brethren, that ye are filled with all knowledge, filled with all goodness, and able also to admonish one another." So, before they start admonishing one another, they have this certain level of of maturity in being filled with knowledge and goodness. That's head knowledge, but also living it out in their life through their, their actions. They're showing that they have a certain level of, of goodness, a certain level of, of Christian maturity in their lifestyle. So every Christian should be responsible and equipped for counseling. And then every Christian can counsel with the same comfort God has used Second Corinthians one verse four. So pop quiz, Ecclesiastes twelve thirteen tells us how to get a fulfilling life. So according to Ecclesiastes, how do we get a fulfilling life? That is fear God and keep His commandments. So fearing God is having a, a relationship with Him. We're taking God seriously. We are afraid. We have terror at his judgment, but we also have awe for him and who he is and his goodness. So it's the the perfect love that we have that casts out the fear, but the, the idea of fearing God is more than just the terror that you have when you do something wrong. Small children, when they know they're doing something wrong, they often respond in fear because they know their parents will be upset. That should be entry-level relationship with God. We should be afraid of his judgment. But then at the next level, we, we build the relationship to one of love and awe. Then it says to keep his, his commandments. If we fear God, then we will do what he has commanded us. And so we will obey. Um, Colossians uh, one sixteen. We were created by God, and we were created for him. And then we are meant to praise God for his glory, his honor, and his power. We went over how we can share man's purpose. The purpose of mankind, we were created to glorify God. But the Westminster Confession summarizes it very neatly for us when it says, uh, the whole duty of man is to fear God and enjoy him. So the question came up, what is the primary goal in counseling? Yes, to help other believers bring glory to God. The goal is not to make their lives better, but it can be a result. Someone tells us that, blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sitters, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. And he is like the tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth fruit in his season. The the fruitful, the abundant life comes when we are in relationship with God. 
that is not a promise that everything is going to be rainbows and unicorns, but it is the pattern that God has designed for our lives to follow. And so when we are fulfilling our purpose, we are more content with life, even when trials and hard, hardships come. We can have confidence in God because we know he is trustworthy. We can trust him through difficult times. We saw in Ephesians 1 that we can comfort others by sharing the purpose of Christians. So sharing the purpose of mankind, we're all created to glorify God. But specifically, what are Christians supposed to do? Well, the purpose of Christians is to bring God glory as well. So when we read Ephesians 1, we see this pattern of, of Christians bringing glory to God. But in explaining our purpose as believers, it also hits a few high points along the way, the, the motivation behind why we should glorify God. So we saw in Ephesians 1 that the Father is sanctifying believers, the Son is redeeming believers, and the Holy Spirit guarantees our inheritance. And all three of these things are happening to show God's glory. In response to this work of God on our behalf, sanctifying, redeeming, guaranteeing, our response to that should be reliance on God to change people. If we're counseling someone, is it our job to make the person fix all their problems? Can we fix all the person's problems? But God can. Which is why we start with, with the gospel. We tell them about, about Christ, and if they're a believer, then we can move on to, to correcting their behaviors. But it is not our, it is, there is no way that we can be the ones who ultimately change them. The change has to come from them submitting to God. So we are relying on God to change people. And then we should have the same goal that God does when we're working on, on, on encouraging other believers. God's intention, we saw in Ephesians 1, was for his glory. He sanctifies, he redeems, and guarantees our inheritance so that we can bring him glory. And we can share that with people when we're, we're giving them counseling. So the primary purpose of counseling should be to glorify God and encourage others to do the same. So that brings us to today. We're going to put into practice some of what we learned and also really work through some, some major counseling passages as we're, we're going through this today. Our topic is going to be church discipline. So here's, here's the question. What do you do if you catch a, a fellow church member in sin? A lot of people freeze up at that question because there's, there's a lot of ramifications. Like what, what role does the church member play in the church? What could happen if, if they get upset with me? What, what will happen politically in the church? What will happen to my other relationships? A lot of people like that person. So what do we do? Big questions, big problems. But scripture does lay out really a step-by-step -step process we should go through when addressing sin in other believers' lives. So as we also look at this, it'll, it'll relate to how we should respond if someone sins against us. And then it also gives us guidance for how we should counsel someone else if they have been sinned against. So there's both the, well, there's all three. What do you do if you catch someone in sin? How do you respond if someone sins against you? And then how do you counsel someone else if they have been sinned against? To start off, let's go to Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. The, the whole book is really explaining how God's people should live under the new covenant so that they are both free from sin and free from legalism. So how do, we, how do we avoid saying that you have to follow all of the Torah laws for holiness while also avoiding saying that now that we don't live under the law, we can do whatever we want? Where is the balance in there? And for, for this, this new type of living, it has been set up under Christ in the new covenant. 
if Christ has completed, he has fulfilled the old covenant, we're not any longer supposed to live under that, then um, how, how do we still live holy lives if, if we're not trying to follow the, the old covenant laws to do so? And so that's what Galatians is answering. A lot of the people who are accusing Paul of, of being a false teacher are saying, well, you're just saying that people can live however they want. They can delve into sin. They can live sinful lives. And Paul says, no, you're not going to live sinful lives because you have this relationship with Christ now. Christ is living in you and you are freed to live in righteousness. But now he's saying in, in, a, in a, a way of correcting the idea of antinomianism, living without law, he says, now, if you are in a relationship with another believer, your fellow church members, if you have a Christian brother who is caught in sin, what do you do? We can see in this passage that Christians must address sin in other believers' lives. We see that there's this situation being set up where we're catching someone in a sin. You have a brother who's overtaken in a fault. If you are a spiritual or or another way to say that would be a mature believer, then you are responsible to restore this sinner. It is your job to restore him. So the question is, how should you do that? How do you approach someone when they're in sin? Clearly, they're, they're living by the flesh. They're allowing their, their evil desires to control them, to rule things. So how do you address sin in another Christian's life. It's, this is very key. You have to approach him humbly. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, you which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. One of the, one of the best ways to define the word meekness, the way the King James uses it, is with the definition strength under control. You could come against this guy and lambast him, tear into him, chew him out, and be totally justified in doing so. But the command here is that you're, you're supposed to go and address his sin in a very humble spirit, with this spirit of meekness. Your strength is under control. You have the power, you have the ability, you have the right to tear into this guy, but you're going to come to him with this spirit of meekness. Strength under control. This is very much the idea of having a sharp sword buckled to your side, but keeping it sheathed. You could do a lot of damage, but you choose not to for the sake of Christ. So we should approach a sinner overtaken in a fault with humility. It also says here that the humility protects you from sinning. I would say there's there's two two levels that we should look at this from. On the one level, if they're if they're not a Christian, then you should be evangelizing them. Okay. So then you ask if they're a church member or not. If they're a church member, you have to go through the church discipline process, and if they are still unrepentant, that's when you would remove them from the church membership and and in a way, you're cutting them off, but you're not ostracizing them. The idea of not talking to someone at all is only for people who are false teachers and divisive people. Okay. So if someone is, is you know, purposefully teaching false doctrine or they, they're inadvertently teaching false doctrine, but when addressed, they're not repenting of that, then that's when you cut off contact. You don't talk to people. You, the, the idea of shunning someone okay. is when they're, they're a false teacher unrepentant, or they're trying to split the church. They're trying to be divisive. Okay. We're supposed to separate from divisive people. So we're going we're gonna to cover a lot of that in the lesson today. Oh, perfect. Okay. Yep. So when you, when you catch a Christian in sin, the goal should be restoration. And then when you approach him, you should come in a very humble spirit, considering yourself, lest thou also be tempted. So that last phrase, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted, there is a significant risk of having a, a, a sinful attitude when you come to somebody, that attitude of, of pride or throwing accusations around, you could be wrong when you come to address sin in someone else's life. 
you may be, be misunderstanding, misconstruing something that they're doing. And if you're, if you're taking an a incorrect approach to things, well, then you're the one who's going to end up needing to, to be corrected and needing to apologize. When that happens, you are falling into this, into this sin. You're falling into this temptation. So you, you have to be careful. When you come to someone, you have to come with the, the meekness that this passage encourages. This process is what we refer to as church discipline. Church discipline doesn't always mean that we're removing someone from membership in the church. The reality is any time that you address some problem in another believer's life, you confront them over, over some fault that they have, you are engaging in church discipline. Now, that doesn't always mean that it's at the point where you take it before the elders or, or you uh, remove them from membership of the church. Those things should be the last case scenario, you know, the, the end of the line when the person is, is refusing to repent. But any time that you just go to a, a Christian brother and say, hey, you know, I think you spoke out of turn there. Maybe you should go apologize to whoever. Or you say, you know, that, that, was, that was inconsiderate, that was unkind. That kind of, of confrontation is church discipline. This is significant because when it comes to, to counseling someone, they come into a counseling office and you're, you're talking with them, you know, over coffee. There is a difference between someone who is actively fighting against the sin and, and looking to overcome that temptation and someone who's just fully given over to their sin. They've fully given over to their lust and they're, they're living in unrepentant sin. In both of those cases, you have to, you have to address them, you have to confront them of their sin and seek to restore them in the spirit of meekness. But if you're talking to an unbeliever who's living in unrepentant sin, well, if they're going to repent of their sin, that means they need to accept Christ. And then those sin habits can begin to, to be worked on. But if they're, if they're not a believer, then the Holy Spirit's not going to be working in their life. They're not going to, they're really not going to be at a, at a place where they are repenting to, to God. Now, if they're a member of the church and they're not living like a believer, well, then that does need to be addressed. And it may be that they do need to be removed from church membership because okay. of their lifestyle. So this is, the, this is the, the problem of church discipline. A lot of people don't like it. They think church discipline is just the level when you go to the elders. You remove them from the membership roles and you, you kick them to the street. But the, the reality is that church discipline is, a, is really a beautiful process. I hope through our lesson today, we can really get into exploring how we can love church discipline we can find it to be something that's very encouraging and helpful. <clears throat> I often see a lot of churches, when conflict does come up, they are either slow to get involved in church discipline, or they avoid it altogether. And sometimes they, they even just ignore the problem and don't even, don't even address it. But when we are coming into this, it is our responsibility to, to make sure that these processes are both being followed correctly. If we're ever involved or we're ever advising on a situation, we should be pointing people to this process. And then when we are, are counseling people, this is a process that we're engaging with with every counselee that we, we come in contact with. A lot of people dislike church discipline because they see it as being very harsh, very unloving, men knowing that you're my disciples by the love you have one for another, and they completely overlook what true love does. True love looks out for your best. It values you too much to let you continue living in these self-destructive habits, to let you keep destroying your life with sin. So true love is going to come and confront another believer. The idea of love being tolerance is very popular in our world today. It's infiltrated churches, it's infiltrated our society, it's why so many young people are, are going into these, these perverted lifestyles, because you're just supposed to tolerate, you're just supposed to accept people for who they are. 
Well, the Bible doesn't say anything about tolerating or accepting sin. So if something is truly a, a sinful habit, a sinful behavior, a sinful lifestyle, it needs to be addressed because we love them and we don't want them to be, to be confronted facing the, the, the um, judgment that comes with unrepentant sin. So the question is, how can we learn to love church discipline? I think we can learn to love it if we truly understand the process. If we understand how it works and how it's supposed to play out, it really is a beautiful process with the goal of restoration. We want people to be restored. That mm -hmm. should be our goal. Yeah. So Galatians 6.1, <clears throat> we're supposed to be looking to restore them in the spirit of meekness, not coming down on them with an iron fist. You're going to live my way or we're, we're kicking you out of the community. Mm -hmm. It's coming to someone and saying, Hey, I think I see a problem here. You know, what's going on? How are you doing? And then as, as you begin to work with them, you get, begin to see what their, where their heart is. If they really want to overcome the problem, if they're doing things, taking the proper steps to address it, or if they've just fully given in, they're fully diving into the sin that they're, they're committing their lives to. The one person is going to face more of the, the excommunication where the other person you know, as long as they are, are continuing to repent, continuing to work on their, their struggles, we're going to keep them in, in fellowship of the believers. We're going to keep encouraging them. Anytime you go and address a sin in, a, in another believer's life, mm -hmm. that is engaging in church discipline. doesn't matter what your position is. Okay. If a pastor ends up in sin, mm -hmm. someone can come and address it to him. He doesn't mm -hmm. have a bishop who's, mm -hmm. you know, in charge of 15 churches who comes down and, and you know, reads in his Miranda rights, right. he can have, you know, a deacon or, or, you know, a teen in the church come up and say, hey, I don't think you should have done that. We see also that we are responsible for, for holding each other accountable, but it should be with the goal of, of making peace. So that's where I'm come, going to with this Matthew 5, 9 passage. We see that, that those who are making peace, the peacemakers, are blessed for they shall be called the children of God. This goes right along the John 13, 35 passage. People know that we're believers because we love the brethren. We also know that people are believers if they are looking to make peace. People who are just out to cause conflict, out to confront people, they, they're just looking for a fight. Well, you, th there's not fruit there to show that they're a Christian. But if you see someone who's genuinely looking to, to bring peace to God's people, that is what a, a child of God looks like. So you can identify a Christian by his desire for peace. Then in John 13, 35, we see how, how people know, if you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. So here Christ is saying, the way that, that you're going to stand out from the world around you is the love that you have for other, other believers, other Christians. These passages come together to show us that Christians really are responsible for maintaining peace, for showing love to each other. And we're going to see how doing that requires us to be involved in church discipline. So if you are a Christian, you must pursue peace with other believers out of love for them. Not a, not a power trip, not a desire to show people how smart you are or how well studied to try and control people. None of that is where we should be coming from. We should be approaching things from a position of, of looking out for other people's best. What is good? What, what can I do out of love for other believers? So I have outlined a six-step process for the way church discipline should take effect step by step. So this goes along with, with both Mike and Anna's question about, you know, in what situations, how do we know when to take it to the next level, um, who, who needs to be involved at the different stages. That's where this six-step process is going to become really important. There are two passages that I'm going to touch on before we get to Matthew 18. Our, our step one is going to start in 1 Peter 4, 8. There's four steps outlined in Matthew 18, but before we get to that level, 
we can we can ask ourselves a couple of questions before we get to the level of, of confronting someone else with church discipline. So, 1 Peter 4, 8 says, And above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover a multitude of sin. So in our first step of biblical rec reconciliation, we catch a believer in a sin. We ask, can love cover it? For 1 Peter 4, 8, it says, love shall cover a multitude of sins. If you really love somebody, if you really care about them, you're not going to allow minor offenses to really cause a problem. And love can cover a multitude of sins. Now, if it's something that's more egregious, that's hurting other people, that really bothers you on a deep level and, and you're having trouble getting over it, walking past it, that's when you have to take it to the next step. So if, if it's not something that love can cover, that's when we go to step two. Uh, step two is in Matthew 7, 3 through 5. And why beholdest thou the mote, or the splinter, that is in thy brother's eye? But considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye. How wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the, the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite. First cast out the beam of thine own eye, and thou shalt see clearly to cast out the mote of thy brother's eye. Here we see that before we go and address a problem in someone else's life, we have to humbly assess our own flaws. We have to look at, at if this is something where we, we even have a place to address it in someone else. You need to check yourself to see if you have the kind of, of sin that you're accusing someone else of. If you're guilty of no one else is going to want to hear you, they need to see the, the kind of integrity in your own life before they'll listen to what you have to say about their life. So this, this step two is that we need to humbly assess our flaws. As we move forward, we're going to see how we're, how we're supposed to humbly confront people. We're supposed to bring witnesses, then tell the church, and then we're going to go and, and evangelize. If someone is removed from the, the, the membership, we're supposed to treat them like an unbeliever and go and evangelize that person. And then we'll also move forward and discuss what can you trust someone with, even if they have repented? Can you trust them with all the same responsibilities that you have before? Um, and then we're going to see you know, what, what forgiveness is and what forgiveness is not. And then we'll just cover cover concluding with a few more details finishing off so we've probably got enough material for for a couple more weeks here so we'll we'll work our way through it and see where where things go